Welcome back students for our second lecture of physical chemistry. Today we'll be going through sections 12.5 through 12.7 of the textbook and we'll look at a couple more experiments that define Newtonian uh, mechanics. Our learning goals for today will be the same as last time, so we're going to want to describe the limits of classical physics for our, our experiments we're talking about today and compare the quantum mechanical and classical uh, explanations for these experiments and why the quantum mechanical proves superior. We'll look at the de Broglie wavelength, um, and that's something you want to be able to do and you want to be familiar with. It's very fundamental for talking about wave particle duality, which is a, a fundamental part of quantum mechanics. And then we'll look at the Bohr model of the atom and see how quantum mechanics helps us describe, you know, how atoms uh, work. Um, so let's pick up where we left off last time, um, where we looked at the first couple experiments, so uh, our black body radiation and our photoelectric effect. And these experiments defied classical mechanics and they required this new and strange quantum mechanical ideas to help explain them. Uh, and today we're gonna pick off with, uh, or continue with two more. Um, the first one we'll discuss is the infamous double slit diffraction experiment. So I'm sure you guys all remember this from Gen Chem and probably even high school for most of you. Um, but what we wanna do is, is start off by considering, you know, what is actually going on here? Why is this such a strange experiment? And to do that, we're gonna start by looking at diffraction. Um, so diffraction is a phenomenon related to waves, uh, and that's the, the key to keep in mind. So waves diffract, particles do not diffract. It doesn't make any sense to talk about a particle uh, diffracting. Um, so we can think about, you know, what a wave is and what this diffraction is for a wave. And so I have this, this uh, GIF up here, um, and we can see that when you drop two uh, drops of water, uh, in or, or in, into more water, uh, we have this uh, diffraction. And you can see here, even in the middle, the, the diffraction, the interference is so much that it causes water to pop out of the surface. It's so strong there. And it, water can do this because the water molecules altogether act like a wave, but a particle couldn't do this. A water molecule couldn't do this. A rock couldn't do this. It doesn't make sense to think about it. Uh, a particle is diffracting. So only waves uh, diffract. Before we get to quantum mechanical diffraction, we can think about just plain old regular diffraction of waves, um, and it will do that by thinking of light. So in 1801, uh, Thomas Young showed that light diffracted, which ended the debate that had raged for a couple centuries since Newton on whether light was a particle or it was a wave. Uh, if light is diffracting, which Young showed it did, that means that light has to be a wave and not a particle. Now, of course, this clashes with what we talked about last time with Einstein, showing that light does in fact act as a particle. And again, that's why that's so weird. Um, so what happens when light diffracts? Uh, well, what happens is it shines through a slit. So here we can see incoming light of a certain wavelength. So lambda is our symbol for wavelength there. Shining through a slit of length A. And what it does is it makes this funky pattern. So rather than just beaming all the way through like a particle would, if you were hucking baseballs at a wall and there was a hole in the wall, that all go straight through the hole. Uh, light goes through a pretty weird uh, scenario. It mostly hits straight through, but it has these diffractions where it's bounced off to the side. Now, we have learned that light does this, but if we actually think about our daily lives, it turns out that light doesn't really do this. Uh, so for example, this is something that happened to me all the time and I'm gonna assume it happens to you. Um, imagine yourselves uh, when you're you know, trying to get to sleep and there's either a crack in your blind or your curtains not flush up against the window and there's a street light or something on outside and light is shining in through your window, or maybe it's the light from the morning sun, you don't want to get up. Now, what does that light do? Uh, does it get a diffraction pattern in your room? Do you see a whole bunch of maxima and minima of this light bouncing around on your wall? Uh, no, you don't. Uh, if you're anything like me, what you see is a big, one big beam of light right on your eyeball and you can't go back to sleep when you're awake. So our experience seems to suggest that light doesn't actually diffract, but we read in all these textbooks you've been taught since high school that light does diffract. Uh, so what's going on? It turns out that to get uh, any kind of wave to diffract, uh, the slit they need to pass through needs to be on the order of magnitude of its own wavelength. Uh, 
Uh, so for example, you can think of an ocean wave coming in the ocean that's not diffracting when it's hitting on the whole ocean there. And it's the same kind of thing when light shines through your, your crack in your blinds. So for example, visible light, if we take red light, uh, it has a wavelength of about 600 uh, nanometers. It's not gonna dif diffract through a one centimeter slit in your blinds, um, which is you know many about four orders of magnitude larger. Uh, but it would diffract if it shone through a 1,000 nanometer slit. And that's what Young had in order to show that light diffracts. Now, we don't easily in our, our daily lives have access to 1,000 uh, nanometers. So that's, if we did, we could easily observe the diffraction of light. Um, and that's due to this following relationship uh, that the diffraction angle theta, so that's going to be here, this angle, uh, that we see here. So this first uh, minimum uh, is right here. That would be that angle. And that's going to correspond to n lambda over a. That's simply uh, n is an integer and lambda is the wavelength. Um, we have to have, uh, in order for sine to be zero, right, in order to get this angle to be zero, um, theta has to be some integer number of uh, uh, pi. Um, so if we have n lambda over a, we have this integer uh, there, and that's going to give us uh, a zero uh, on our intensity. And, and if our uh, A is too big uh, compared to our wavelength, that angle is going to be too small and we're not going to be able to observe it. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, so in this picture, we can see it in this blue trace. This is light as we often experience it. And in red, this is the diffraction that we would see if we were to have light uh, of such a small wavelength and a slit of an approximate you know, equal wavelength that it can go through. Uh, this is probably easier to see, so this single slit diffraction, it's probably easier to see if we think about uh, double slit uh, diffraction. Um, and so here, before we get into double slit diffraction, we'll just show kind of what is going on and why we see these maxima and minima. Uh, so here you can see light beaming through. Uh, here, in this case, the offset uh, as light goes through at this angle, which it will go through at all of the angles. Uh, the maximum here cancels out with the minimum here, and we get uh, destructive interference. It's also possible to get constructive interference and increasing the signal, and that's going to happen at other angles. Um, so we'll look at double slit diffraction on the next slide. That kind of shows us, you know, what's, uh, uh, what's going on, and it's a little bit easier to see, but it's the same basic idea. Again, remember uh, that only light can diffract. And so you can imagine what we would do if we shot a particle through a slit. Well, it wouldn't matter if the slit was smaller than the particle, the particle wouldn't fit through. If it was bigger than the particle, the particle would just go right through the slit. But it, one particle can't create a diffraction with itself, right? It's just one particle. So particles would just go right through uh, the slit. Now, uh, here again, we have double slit diffraction. And the results that we see here make total sense if we shine the light through the slit. Um, and you can see there's plenty of videos online. I might post a couple for you to check out if this is confusing at all. Um, and light will go through, uh, waves including light will go through these slits and they'll make uh, the following diffraction pattern here as they diffract off of each other. Uh, and again, this is pretty similar if we go back a slide and look at the ripples that the water makes. Um, this is the same kind of pattern that we would get, uh, increasing maxima and minima at different angles based on the wavelength of light. Now, what's disturbing is that uh, electrons, when they're shot through single and double slits like this, uh, also diffract. And so to be clear, what's going on here is not electrons bouncing off each other. That is not diffraction. That's going to be collision. The electrons are shot through the slit one at a time, and they diffract. So the actual experiment, the way it goes, uh, is if we have both of these slits open, uh, the electrons hit the detector at the end. So this is an, an example of the detector. Uh, and A, B, C, D, E is increasing over time. So the electrons are hitting these at individual points like we would expect an electron to, because this electron uh, is a particle. So we would expect it to hit at individual points. But the points it hits are in a diffraction pattern. Um, and, and so this is, is very strange to us because it's showing that, well, they're hitting at certain points, they're particles, but they're diffracting, so they're waves. Um, and this gives us this infamous wave-particle duality. And it's, this is one of the, the 
kind of craziest ideas of quantum mechanics, but it's so central to quantum mechanics. Everything we do in quantum mechanics is built off of this idea. Um, and it, living in the 21st century, we just kind of have internalized this and go, oh yeah, of course, everything is a wave and a particle and we move on with our lives without really grasping the weirdness of this. So hopefully in this class, we have kind of the opportunity to grasp uh, some of the weirdness of this. Um, also pretty weird, uh, if we close one of the slits, the particle only goes through one slit or the other slit. Um, and so half of the particles are blocked. So if we have both slits open, they go through apparently both slits at the same time. If one slit is closed, it only goes through one slit and then the, other, the rest are blocked by the, the other slit. Um, so again, pretty weird stuff. So keep this experiment in the back of your mind. Uh, a full explanation of this requires uh, some uh, of the basics of, of quantum mechanics that we'll go through in the coming weeks. So we'll get back to this. We'll talk about what uh, the theory thinks is going on here. Um, but again, this is something that can't be explained uh, by classical mechanics. Uh, and we need quantum mechanics in order to make any sense out of this. So what we need now is a mathematical way to describe how particles are waves. Um, again, and this, is, this can be pretty hard to fully grasp, uh, and I would encourage you to just do the math and the math works out, um, and, and do ponder these sort of very hard and obtuse uh, topics, but again, recognizing that no one really understands these as well as we'd like to. Um, so to mathematically describe these new wave particles, and again, we have to call them wave particles because they have both wave properties and particle properties. Uh, we turn to the uh, French uh, uh, mathematician and, and physicist, uh, de Broglie. So that's how you pronounce this uh, word there. Uh, that's his name and it's French, so of course it's pronounced pretty weird. Um, and so he is kind of doing the inverse of what Einstein did, where Einstein said, hey, these light waves are actually photon particles. Uh, de Broglie is trying to explain, well, these very small, obviously particles, things like electrons, are also uh, waves. So waves are particles and particles are waves, hence wave-particle uh, duality. Um, so the de Broglie wavelength is shown here. So again, lambda, lambda are symbol for wavelength. Uh, the wavelength of a particle uh, is equal to Planck's constant, so that's H, divided by the particle's momentum. Uh, and the momentum is, of course, the mass times the velocity. So this is a very fundamental relationship. We'll use it in Schrodinger's wave equation that relates the mass and velocity of a wave to, or of a particle, sorry, to its wavelength. Um, so we can go through some examples. Um, if we think about an electron, a very, very small thing, uh, right, we have a very small mass here. Uh, dividing by a very small number is going to give us a very large number. So this very small particle might have a meaningful wavelength. Um, so we can calculate, uh, you know, let you do this on your own, uh, calculate the wavelength of an electron uh, with a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, uh, going at about 24 million meters per second, or 2.4 million, rather, uh, meters per second, which has about 17 electron volts of energy. So if we do that, we calculate a wavelength of 0 0.3 uh, nanometers. Um, and when we get to the nanometer scale, that's about how far atoms are in a crystalline solid. Uh, so now we have a slit, right, a crystalline solid, which we can pass these uh, very fast moving electron wave particles through to observe their diffraction. Uh, you can go through another example here. I'll let you do that on your own. We can compare answers in class of a macroscopic object going at a, a normal speed. So 50 meters per second is about 100 miles per hour for a baseball, which is pretty fast. Uh, the pitchers can throw that. Um, and you'll see that, that has basically no wavelength, nothing meaningful that we can interact with. So the wavelength of a baseball is not going to be relevant. Um, in 1927, uh, Davison and Germer demonstrated the wave nature of electrons, again, by shining them through some sort of crystalline solid. Uh, it's been about 100 years since then here in, uh, in 2021. And uh, uh, diffraction has been shown for particles, uh, or for atoms as big as neon. So an electron uh, has this very small mass, but uh, neon is going to be uh, about uh, 40,000 times the weight of an electron at 20 atomic mass units. 
Um, so that has been shown to diffract neon atoms and the de Broglie relationship has been verified for molecules as heavy as tetraphenyl porphyrin, which has a, an atomic mass of 614 uh, atomic mass units. Um, so again, the, the point here, the focus is that when we have these wave particles, just like light, they're not always gonna act like wave particles. In fact, most of the time they're going to act like particles. So an electron inter or acts like a particle uh, almost all the time until you engage it on uh, scales that approximate its wavelength. So if we shot an electron through a crystalline solid, it's going to diffract. If you shot an electron through a uh, one millimeter gap, it's not going to diffract, it's gonna act like a particle. Um, and in the same way, we'll see later, if we talk about, you know, how does the electron relate in distance to the nucleus, now it's going to, uh, again, it's a very small distance, and it's going to act like a wave particle again. That's going to be crucial for how uh, it behaves. The last experiment uh, that we'll look at before delving into the details of quantum mechanics next week is that of the hydrogen atom emission spectrum. And so we'll couple this in to Bohr's model of the atom. And let's take a step back and, and think about, you know, what is an atom? The first modern model of the atom comes from John Dalton at the beginning of the 19th century. And he simply defines an atom uh, as this little black uh, point here, that's the atom, and then it's surrounded by globes of heat. Um, so his model seems very archaic uh, to us, but it represents the first uh, new explanation of atoms since uh, basically Democritus uh, in ancient Greek times. Um, and his, his uh, information that he used to build this atom, his experiments are primarily uh, based on uh, ideal gases. Um, so moving on from Dalton, we got a little bit more information about, you know, what's going on uh, in atoms and smaller particles in atoms. Uh, so J.J. Uh, Thompson discovered the uh, electron, and now we had to explain how electrons are in atoms. You know, they're coming from atoms. What are they doing? And this is the infamous plum pudding model, where we have a, a sea of positive charge, that's the pudding, and then we have electrons that are little particles embedded in the pudding, uh, like plums. Um, and we know again that that model is, is not right. Uh, a few years after this, Rutherford came up with his nuclear model. He did this with this gold foil experiment. He shot uh, uh, alpha particles at gold foil and he noticed that some of them bounced back while most passed through. So most of the atom has to be empty space, but there's these small, dense, probably positively charged uh, nuclei to counteract that. Um, and, and this is where we take off at the beginning of quantum mechanics. Uh, now, this model is very familiar to us, and it's also very, very horribly wrong. Uh, and this was, of course, known to Rutherford and everyone else at the time, uh, that this model was is inherently flawed. And, and the reason is should be obvious to us as senior chemistry students is that how can you have a positively charged nucleus and a negatively charged electron uh, basically very, very close to each other. How would they not uh, attract each other and then stick together? Um, and this was, of course, known by Rutherford, but he had to propose a model that was consistent with the experiment. He said, this is, this is what the experiment looks like, and, and I can't explain it. Um, and we'll go forward and see how Bohr, you know, elegantly uh, explains this with one other uh, uh, piece of information. So we have this model. We don't, we're not quite sure what to do with it. Um, we also have this weird data that we're not quite sure what to do with. So we have the hydrogen emission spectrum. Um, so the hydrogen emission spectrum comes from when you uh, shoot uh, lots of energy into hydrogen or any uh, atom. Uh, it will emit certain frequencies of light. Hydrogen is the simplest one. We'll talk about why that is way on in class. We'll see that in the future. Um, but it emits certain uh, frequencies of light. And specifically, hydrogen emits four visible wavelengths of light, with of course lots of other wavelengths of light that aren't visible. And it wasn't known why this was the case. And again, here we can see the, the quantization of quantum mechanics. Um, so we have quantized wavelengths of light coming out of hydrogen. We know the wavelength is related to the frequency, which is related to the energy. So we have quantized energies. Only certain energies of light are able to be emitted or absorbed, of course, uh, by the hydrogen atom. Uh, but again, this is very strange in a classical world where we are primarily 
uh, continuous in terms of what our energy does. Uh, now, there, this problem was somewhat solved pretty elegantly uh, in 1885 by uh, Rydberg. And what he noticed is that the uh, energy of these, and in this case, uh, we're going to represent energy in inverse centimeters. We'll, we'll see this more in the future. This is a convenient spectro uh, spectroscopy unit for relating energy. Um, and it's simply one over the wavelength and it's related to the energy. So the energy of these light in inverse centimeters is simply equal to a constant. So this RH here is the Rydberg constant uh, multiplied by one over NF squared minus one over NI squared, where NF and NI are integers. Um, so he explained kind of how we get these numbers, but, but what the heck is going on here? Why are we using integers? Now, I think you guys probably all know why we're using integers. So that's to do with the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. Um, but of course, at the time, this doesn't make any sense to anyone. Um, and here, these are, I mentioned this earlier, these are the visible wavelengths uh, coming from the hydrogen atom, and there are many more non-visible wavelengths. So how do we go about solving this? Uh, you know, Niels Bohr will help us understand what's going on here um, uh, with a new and improved model of the atom a couple years after Rutherford's very flawed model that explains both uh, how our electrons don't collapse into the nucleus and how we have these very quantized uh, set of uh, emission spectrum for hydrogen. So Bohr started under the assumption that the electrons were wave particles. He's incorporating this diffraction stuff uh, and the de Broglie, de Broglie wavelengths and so forth. Um, so he's using this uh, wave particles and then he, he sets our electrons against an attractive force. So if we have, uh, we have this attractive force, so electrons are being attracted to the nucleus, we, ha we must have some force that stops it. Um, and this is because we have all this empty space in an atom. So there must be some empty space there. There must be a centrifugal force uh, that's opposing the Coulombic force. Um, and here we have simple expression. So here are one over R squared. Uh, this is our Coulombic attraction. And then our uh, MV squared over R is our centrifugal force. And they are, must be equal to each other to have a stable orbit. Uh, now, here is where the wave particles come in. So he reasoned after he came up with this um, that a particle has to have an orbit that aligns with the wavelength. Um, so here you can imagine this is a particle. If this was the wavelength or if the orbit here is shown as a string, this particle has three wavelengths as it goes along the string. So you could have one wavelength, you could have two wavelengths, you could have three, you could have four. You couldn't have one and a half. Why not? Why couldn't you have one and a half wavelengths? Well, if you had one and a half wavelengths, uh, the starting and ending points of your wave would not be the same. So it would cancel out as it wrote, as it orbited, as it waved around the orbit, um, and it wouldn't exist. So it has to be stuck on these certain orbits. Um, and that gives us a restriction for what the uh, orbit radii could be. So our r here uh, in this expression. So 2 pi r is the circumference of our orbit. Uh, and that has to be n, an integer, times the number of wavelengths. So here we're introducing n small integers uh, into our expression. Uh, and we can rearrange this to, to figure out you know, what r is based on, uh, on uh, uh, the wavelength. So from here, we're going to go ahead and look at the math Bohr did to try to figure out you know, what uh, these wavelengths are, and, and does it make any sense? Can we figure out what these orbital radii are? So I brought us over to the iPad here to uh, go through the math that Bohr did uh, to solve these remaining problems. Um, the first step I've done is combine some of these terms and rearrange. So we have P the momentum times R the radius is equal to NH over 2 pi. Um, the next step we'll do here is rewrite the momentum. So the momentum is, of course, the mass of our electron uh, times the velocity and then times r the radius. And then we're going to do, the for the first time, and we'll do this many times over the course of the semester, we're going to rewrite h over 2 pi as h bar. Uh, that's because h over 2 pi appears very often in quantum mechanics, so we'll simplify that uh, with this h bar symbol. 
Then what we'll do is we'll uh, pool these and we'll set what the velocity is equal to. So the velocity is going to be equal to n h bar divided by the mass of the electron times the radius. Now we'll take this and plug it into Bohr's expression. So Bohr had his Coulombic attractive force, that's E squared over four pi epsilon naught r squared. And that was equal to uh, the mass of the electron times the velocity over r. Here we're gonna substitute in the velocity, or sorry, the velocity squared. So we'll have n h bar over the mass of the electron times r squared, uh, which is n squared h bar squared over the mass of the electron times r cubed. So from here, we can get an expression for r. If we multiply uh, r cubed here to the other side of the equation, we'll get one single r, and we can pool all of the other terms. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that. This gives us r being equal to 4 pi epsilon naught n squared h bar squared divided by the mass of the electron times the fundamental charge of the electron squared. So this is this big old uh, what r is equal to. Um, we can do at this point uh, some rearranging. So we have this 4 pi, we have this h bar squared. And so we'll turn our h bar squared back into h. Uh, and what that gives us is epsilon naught n squared h squared over pi times the mass of the electron times e squared. So at this point, we have quantized orbit length. So r is the orbit of our electrons around the nucleus, and that is equal to uh, this term here. These are all constants with the exception of n. So what that's telling us is that if we have uh, and a, a nucleus here, we can have uh, an electron orbiting here at uh, n equals one, where this is going to be equal to uh, one squared, which is one times uh, all these other constants here. Uh, and then we can have another electron at the next allowable orbit, where this is now four, it's now two squared, and then we'll have nine, 16, and so forth. So the, this gives us uh, quantized orbit lengths. Now, what does this do to the energy? Well, the total energy of, um, of a, an electron here is going to be equal to its kinetic energy plus its potential energy. Um, and that is, of course, uh, simply one half mv squared, I'll write me for the mass of the electron, uh, and then minus the potential energy, which is Coulombic e squared over four pi epsilon naught r. Uh, we have an expression for what the uh, velocity of the electron is. Uh, so we can come down here and set this. We can say this is one half times the mass of the electron times n h bar squared, again, just coming from, uh, oops, coming from up here, what our, our velocity is. Uh, so n h bar squared over m e r. Oh, sorry, the squared is uh, on the outside. Um, and then minus r e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r. Um, and then this gives us uh, the following. So we'll have one half, put that on the outside. And then on the inside, we'll have n squared h bar squared over m e r squared and, and denominator minus e squared over four pi epsilon naught r. At this point, we'll do a little sneaky maneuver. Um, and we'll use this relationship here. So I'll go ahead and write it out in a way I didn't before, uh, where this says e squared over four pi epsilon naught r squared is equal to uh, n squared h bar squared over m e r cubed. Now, in, on this side of the denominator, we have r cubed, and on this side, we have r squared. So what we're going to do is take out one r from each of those which of course we can do, we can multiply both sides of the equation by r without changing the equality. Well, now what we have uh, is this guy, 
which is our same as our, our uh, term here, uh, equal to this guy, which is the same as our second term. Uh, so what that gives us then, again, just going through the math, is now we have uh, one half e squared over four pi epsilon naught r minus one e squared over four pi epsilon naught r, uh, which then uh, is, of course, minus one half e squared over four pi epsilon naught r. So we get a big simplification uh, there. Um, now what we're gonna do is plug in our expression for r that we have up here into r down here in the denominator. Uh, and so what that gives us, so we'll say that our total energy is equal to negative, uh, let's say e squared over eight pi epsilon naught uh, times one over r. Uh, and one, one over r is simply going to be the uh, inverse of this term up here. So that's gonna be then negative e squared over eight pi epsilon naught times pi uh, mass of the electron e squared over epsilon naught n squared h squared. And combining those two terms together and simplifying, we have negative mass of the electron times the fundamental charge 2d fourth over eight epsilon naught squared h bar squared n squared. Now, if we were to look at the measured uh, wavelengths of the hydrogen emission spectrum, what are those? Well, those represent electrons jumping from one energy level to the other and releasing an energy delta E. So in order to calculate our delta E, we need uh, our delta E is equal to E final minus E uh, initial. And these can be any two small integers corresponding to any two allowed radii. Uh, and to do that, we'll recognize that everything in this term is a constant with the exception of n. So this gives us a minus me e to the fourth over eight epsilon naught eight squared h squared times one over n final minus one over n initial, and they're both uh, squared there. Um, and we can flip these around, and this is, people often like this, uh, to get rid of this negative, we can change this final and initial uh, by switching those two around. Uh, so if we have initial minus final, we'll have a positive number there. Um, and you'll recognize that this shares the same form as uh, uh, Rydberg's equation. Uh, but we don't just have some constant RH, we have a whole pool of these other fundamental constants. Uh, and wouldn't you know it, uh, if you put those, if you put all these numbers together, you come up with Rydberg's constant that you determine experimentally. experimentally. So Bohr's model uh, uh, exquisitely shows why we see these uh, wavelengths, why we see these uh, on this discrete wavelengths for the hydrogen atom. Uh, we'll go back here to the PowerPoint slides. We're done with the, the equations. Maybe some of you are happy about that. Um, and we'll uh, continue, just we'll, we'll finish off here. Um, here, so these are the equations that we uh, came up with. And you can see if we use actual, we plug actual numbers in, we can come up with uh, so 656 there, uh, that's one of our, that's our red line from our hydrogen atom emission spectrum. And so Bohr is able to explain this observation that Rydberg had and propose a very elegant model for why the, ad, the electrons don't just collapse in on the nucleus. Um, and so here we can see some of the power of quantum mechanics. Um, now, it turns out that Bohr's model uh, is just as wrong as Rutherford's model and Dalton's model and all the models that have come before it. Um, and the reason for that is because it doesn't account for uncertainty. So we'll talk about uncertainty in the future. Uh, I think a lot of you guys are aware of that. We have Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So if you apply the uncertainty principle to electrons, you'll find that you can't actually know where their uh, radii is, what their orbit is. And that changes the model 
uh, but doesn't change the, the results here. That Bohr's model is able to explain um, what's going on with the hydrogen atom emission spectrum. Uh, we'll also see that it, it doesn't work for other atoms. And we'll look about that uh, in, we'll look at that in the future. Of course, when you throw in another atom like helium, there's two electrons and that complicates the whole scenario. So we'll look at that in the future as well. Um, next time we'll look at Schrodinger's wave equation um, and the wave equation will kind of begin to reconcile these ideas and help us mathematically describe these funny wave particles that we started talking about today. Um, and here you can see again all of the, some of these might be familiar to you, I'm not going to expect you to memorize the names of any of these series, uh, but each of these lines is an observable wavelength of the hydrogen emission spectrum, corresponding from one energy level to another. So uh, to conclude here, um, classical physics around the turn of the century was not able to explain multiple phenomena. And so last time we looked at black body radiation, the photoelectric effect. Today we looked at particle diffraction and the hydrogen emission spectrum, as well as the, the model of the hydrogen atom. And classical physics couldn't explain these adequately. Um, uh, quantum mechanics was able to explain these, and the two principles of quantum mechanics that are central to these uh, are the fact that energy is quantized, that's the quantum and quantum mechanics, and also this notion of wave particle duality. We'll look in the future for a third basic principle of quantum mechanics that is at the fundamental level, uh, level these things are uh, probabilistic rather than deterministic, uh, but we didn't quite get there uh, in these first couple of lectures. So we'll, we'll hold off on that third one for the future. Uh, and with that, I'll let you guys go and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in class on Friday.